Welcome to Financial Repression Authority's Roundtable Insight, where the best fund managers, economists, and industry leaders discuss the key investment issues and challenges in the current macroeconomic environment. Hi, welcome to FRA's Roundtable Insight. This is Richard Benuli. Today we have a very special guest, Gary Schilling, and our partner, Ira Harris. Gary has a legendary career in economics and finance. He's ranked twice as Wall Street's top economist by polls and institutional investor, and also named the country's number one commodity trader advisor by Futures Magazine. He's worked for the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, Merrill Lynch, White Weld and Company, and Standard Oil Company, New Jersey. He publishes the monthly Insight Newsletter, a comprehensive 30 to 40 page report that includes extensive overviews of the economy, and also investigations of key economic indicators, how they affect your investment portfolio. Most interestingly, he's an avid apiarist, beekeeper. Ira is a hedge fund manager, a global trader in foreign currencies, bonds, commodities, and equities for over 40 years. He's also served as CME director for several years. Welcome, gentlemen. Good to be with you. Yep, great to be here. Thanks, Richard. Great. I thought we begin, uh, Gary, with your economic perspective, a macro perspective on the current post-COVID era environment. Your thoughts? Well, I think we're still very much in the COVID environment. As a matter of fact, that's the issue. Every time there's a hope that it's all going to go away and the economies of the world can open up, people get closer together, we get a resurgence. And now you're getting, of course, uh, huge problems again in Europe, closing down uh, threats of that in many areas of the U.S. Uh, you know, until until they develop a, a vaccine, which not only works, is proven, but widely distributed, and most importantly, that people trust, I don't think the economies are, are going to open up and, and that this recession is going to drag on. How soon will that vaccine develop? I would guess it's going to be well into next year before there's much, much change in the environment. And your thoughts also, Ira? Well, I, th I think that's absolutely right. Uh, how long it drags on, we don't know. Uh, I'm uh, blessed, and I mean that. Uh, my oldest brother is a uh, very well-known infectious disease doctor, and we have this conversation all the time. Uh, going back to last February. So uh, he tells me when he thinks that there's interesting things out there, like uh, this week, actually, in the New, uh, New, Journal, New England Journal of Medicine, uh, Lilly uh, announced that they had very similar uh, results than re that Regeneron had with the mo monoclonal um, uh, type of vaccine, which doesn't, of course, cure it, but they found that when they give it to people who are not at the uh, uh, the height of risk, but more moderate, that it does lessen the effects. And, and they've had a lot of uh, effects of this, but we're, we're nowhere uh, close to it. Uh, when I say nowhere close, I mean, you know, it's next week or, yeah, could it be in the first quarter of 2021, I'd be skeptical, but you know, everybody loves a good story. So we'll get through that. We'll get through that. And uh, it, from a market standpoint, it'll probably force whatever happens after the election results that will get a bigger stimulus than otherwise. And it was interesting, I guess, that McConnell today said something about uh, that he would expect to see more uh, state municipal. Uh, aid in whatever is achieved. So we'll go from there. Now, Gary, you've been a long-term bull on U.S. Treasury bonds. Are you still bullish on bonds? And yes, I have. In 1981, um, I said in print, we're entering the bond rally of a lifetime. At that point, the yield on the 30-year Treasury was 14.6%. Now it's 1.6%. And because of the appreciation with the declining rates in the meanwhile, plus, of course, the coupons, uh, long-term treasuries have outperformed, have outperformed the S&P by five and a half times since the early 80s. I still think there's further to go there. 
I wouldn't be a bit surprised if we go back to the low we saw in March on, on, on yields, a high in price, and that was 0.9%. Uh, uh, we could go down 100 basis points from here. After all, I think we're in a very deflationary world environment with a with the virus uh, stretching on uh, with with treasuries as a safe haven. Uh, and if we do see this further decline, uh, just going back to where we were in March, uh, you, you see a overall return on treasury bonds of about 20% from here. And I think that could be wonderful because stocks I think are way overpriced and we could see a, we could see a 30, 40% decline in the S&P 500 uh, during that period. So the, the difference between what I expect in treasuries and stocks would be huge. Mm -hmm. And would there be any conditions or trends that could happen that would cause you to change your perspective on this? Well, of course, we, we, we will have to see how the election uh, works out. And, and this is being contested and it's going to drag on uh, before there's final uh, settlement on this. Uh, but I, I don't think it, it makes a great deal of difference. The, the odds right now of a complete sweep of the White House and both houses of Congress by either the Republicans or Democrats, I think are almost nil. And unless you get that, I don't think there's gonna be any, any big change. Yeah, of course, there are differences in philosophy. Uh, Trump is more for deregulation. Uh, he's very much down on China, but so is, so is uh, Biden. Uh, Biden is much more for the typical democratic uh, goals, or income redistribution, higher taxes on corporations, higher taxes on, on uh, upscale individuals, redistribute the money downward to their constituents, uh, more regulation. Uh, you, you do have those differences, but in terms of immediate implement, I implementation on either, either side, um, I just don't, I just don't see any dramatic changes in the next, uh, well, within, let's say the next six months or a year. Mm -hmm. And Ira, what are your thoughts on U.S. Treasury bonds? Well, you know, I'm not uh, bullish on Treasury bonds. It's been an uh, unbelievable run, but it's, to me, it's a traders, it's a trading market. Um, and you could say, well, everything Ira you think is a trading market. No, but I think that's a trading market. It's like last night I actually bought the 30 years on the uh, initial discussion about whether the Senate was going to hold because uh, everybody was thinking blue wave. And with the blue wave, they had put on steepeners. I mean, we saw some fairly uh, consistent steepening of the, of the curve. And I said, uh, that is, that's not going to work out because um, now they'll unwind, which they did today. We saw some significant flattening from where the recent movements. Um, I, I just, you know, I, I I, you know, I, I go back to uh, Richard, uh, many discussions we had with David Rosenberg and Lacey Hunt, and I know that uh, Dr. Schilling has been in this camp too, and I, and I was for a long time because I, I believe in the economic impact of intertemporal misallocation or uh, dislocation, whichever one you want to throw at it, uh, and that with all the debt piled on, that that creates deflationary wins, but. I think that the Fed uh, and, uh, is is going to come with some yield curve control because they just, that's why it was to me easy to buy the 30 years last night as a trade. Yields have just gotten too high and now we have a Fed meeting and the Fed is going to, is in a, has painted themselves into a difficult situation because how are they going to let interest rates rise, especially with massive uh deficit building and building and building and the cost of financing that at some point is is going to be prohibitive so they just can't let it go there so I, you know i understand the trading aspect of it but i you know i tie it into uh especially uh and i guess we we can take off from here is where does the dollar go because i think the dollar has a, a big part in this discussion because the dollar is going to weaken then you know, I think yeah, that the bonds are not going to perform nearly as well. So I'll drop it there and we'll, I'll see where we go. Gary, what are your thoughts on the U.S. dollar and how it plays into your overall perspective and views? It's part of the same play. It's a safe haven. 
you know, the dollar is a preeminent currency in the world. And when there's trouble, people go for the for the safe haven. And, and, and that is a dollar. There's really no there's no alternative. I mean, think about it with currencies. There's always two parts of a trade in currency. You're getting out of one and into another. And if you say if people don't like the dollar, OK, maybe you see maybe it's the cleanest shirt in the laundry. Maybe it's the slowest falling rock. Maybe it's a they, maybe it's the Victorian in summer remedial school. I mean, you can say there's a lot of things you don't like about the dollar, but in, in relation to anything else, uh, there really isn't much choice. The, the only other currencies that I think anybody would really be interested in are very small. They, they can't accommodate a lot, of, a lot of investment, a lot of activities, things like the Singapore dollar, like the Swiss franc. Uh, the Japanese do not want the yen to be an international currency. The Chinese do, but they want to control it. And uh, we did a, a study of currencies going back to ancient Greek and Roman times. And one of the characteristics of a leading currency is that it's got to be it's got to be freely traded. It's got to be open. It's got to be available. And and the Chinese, they want to control it. They want the cake, their cake and eat it, too. You really just come down. There isn't much. There isn't much in the way of alternative to the dollar. Interesting. And overall, in the medium to long term, do you see the potential for a stagflationary environment due to rising inflation, supply chain disruptions, perhaps? Uh, no, not at all. You know, if, if you look at it, I, I think it's really a very simple situation. It's supply and demand. When you have an excess of supply over demand, which you do now with globalization on a global on a worldwide basis, you have deflationary pressures. Now, why do you have a surplus of supply over demand? Well, it's basically because the Asians are big producers, but they are very poor consumers. You look at consumer spending, and in this country, it's 68% of GDP. In China, it's only 39%. It's only about half as much. In other words, the Chinese are big producers. They are not spenders. So you end up with a savings glut. And the same is true of other Asian countries. So you have the situation. The only way I think you could get inflation uh, is if you had the, the borders completely sealed to imports and then there were huge monetary and fiscal stimuli. In other words, you, you cut off supply and created a huge excess demand. I don't see that happening, but I don't see any other way that you could get away from the deflationary pressures. And, you know, we're very close to absolute deflation for the major indices, the producer price index, the the consumer price index, various measures. And I, I think as this as this pandemic wears on, we're going to see uh, a continued low and probably a negative numbers on on inflation. And of course, that's a that's a big problem for central banks. And already you have negative rates in Japan and the European Central Bank. Uh, the Fed has resisted this, uh, I think, for interesting reasons. But but you're really, they're really dealing with an effect of a deflationary world. And the Fed has admitted this. They threw in the towel on their 2% target on inflation. They haven't been able to meet it. Uh, they basically admitted defeat and said, okay, we're just going to widen the range to the point it doesn't make any difference. So you're in a deflationary world in my, in my judgment. And your thoughts, Ira? Well, I, you know, I, again, uh, you know, I, I just, I, I see it and I, and I certainly, understand uh, the impact of globalization. I mean, it's, it's why I've railed against the uh, Phillips curve even when I was in graduate school, because to me it was uh, back in the 70s, because it was too limiting and didn't take into account the uh, international implications of capital and, and labor, both. Um, so I always found it somewhat deficient, but, uh, but you know, I, I just deal with the question, the Fed may be throwing in the towel, Gary says, but, you know, I see them that they, they have some tools available. And especially because I, I don't disagree, a, a, a strong dollar is maybe one of the greatest uh, proponents of deflation because of the huge amount of borrowing that takes place with 11, 12, 13, 14 trillion, according to the uh, IIF, International Institute of Finance. Uh, it's enormous. And if the dollar goes higher, especially in the developing world, the impacts will be great. And it'll force people to sell 
whatever they have because they'll they'll be in a desperate situation to to raise the dollars that they need. So it's when I look at it, when I look at this, I go, and I know the Fed did this right back in uh, March and April when they really increased the uh, dollar swap lines. But the Fed does, they may have a dual mandate, but because of the role of the reserve currency, they need to flood the international system at times with dollars, which I think goes a long way towards uh, preempting the deflationary uh, wins. So uh, I, I think that they have more tools and, and I believe that. So, and that keeps me uh, n- not in that deflation camp. In fact, you know, I think they're going to do pull something here. Uh, I know that the velocity of money is very important and I still look at that. Uh, not a lot of people do. But yeah, the velocity has collapsed. I mean, yeah, you, absolutely. The Fed comes out that money, and nobody wants it. Yep. And, but on a global basis, especially because of the role of the big banks, and some of them have really pulled in their horns. And you look at the banking sectors in Europe, uh, certainly in Japan. I mean, they're they're an abomination. So, but I, to me, if the Fed really wanted to to shake the world up, um, and I know some you know people don't view central banks like that, but they could really flood the international system with dollars and see where it goes from there. So uh, listen, if the dollar strengthens, I'm absolutely a deflationist and I'll get long a bond portfolio. If the dollar starts to weaken, I think that uh, I I would go the other way because I would view that as uh, a headwind against deflation and I'd be very concerned about that. Well, well, how how would the Fed do anything more to flood the world with dollars than they are now? They're buying everything in sight. They have all kinds of reciprocal agreements with other central banks. Uh, I mean, what else could they do to get more dollars into circulation? They have a huge, uh, what, $2 trillion in excess reserves. Uh, You know, we mentioned the monetary velocity. It's collapsed. Nobody wants the dollars. They're just lying there fallow as bank reserves. I mean, what could they do to get get even more money out there? They've done everything they can. Well, the, yeah, but the swap lines at the end of June basically got paid down because the crisis had been averted. So if we go back into it, meaning that the dollar starts to rally and there's another mad scramble for the dollars to meet the, the uh, obligations, uh, then that's where I would look for them. And right now, it would not make any sense. They'd be wasting uh, they'd be expending ammunition for no purpose whatsoever. But I, I want to see what what does happen here because if if the global economy starts to slow down dramatically from here, then I think you will get a bid for dollars, and the Fed is really going to be pushed to see what they do on a global basis. And we talked about globalization, uh, Gary. Do you see? Globalization is reversing somewhat, but shifting to more pl- politically platable Asian countries, except for maybe China and Mexico relative to China? Well, it depends on how you define globalization. I mean, globalization, as I define it, is basically taking Western technology and combining it with cheap Asian labor. You get this huge production, as I explained earlier, they're not consuming it, so they're exporting it. And those exports are coming back to North America and and Europe. Now, where that production takes place is less important than the fact that it is taking place in low cost, in low cost, high savings countries. Of course, you're seeing production move out of China to uh, Bangladesh, to Vietnam, to India, to Pakistan. Why? For a couple of reasons. One is simply to get out of the line of fire from the trade war, which Trump has been waging, and Biden is playing me too on that. And the other reason is that China is trying to get much more of a domestic-driven economy. Now, to do that, they have to have more consumer spending. I mentioned earlier that uh, 39% of GDP in China is consumer spending, 68% in the the U.S. They need more consumer spending. Uh, They need to have more income to get that uh, spending. And, and one of the reasons that they are increasing minimum wages, and they do that on a provincial basis, 25 or 30 percent a year in, in a number of provinces, is to get more income into the hands of people who will spend it and give a more uh, a domestic-oriented economy. They also need to beef up the equivalent of Social Security and Medicare and so on. People have to save for those things, for the education of their, 
one or now maybe two children. Okay, so what happens? So China is no longer the low cost producer. And a lot of that production is just naturally moving to these other areas, say both to get out of the line of the fire of the trade wars and also because it's cheaper. So that doesn't change the facts of globalization, it just changed locale. And, and you know, you pick up a, you pick up a shirt and whether it's made in, in, and I'm wearing one right now, it says made in Vietnam. Well, if I bought a year ago, it probably would have been said made in China. Make any difference? No, same high quality shirt. Interesting. And your thoughts, Ira? No, no, I, I agree with that. You know, and it's been the, and I know Michael Pettis has made that argument for, for quite a while. And it's why so many people have gotten caught on the wrong end of the yuan trade, because I think, you know, the Chinese are helping push the yuan higher because look at, if you're trying to convert some more of your economy to a consumer, to a domestic consumption base, you want on your currency because imported goods or goods in general, well, especially imported uh, material, uh, raw material goods, everything gets a little bit cheaper and you enrich your, your population that, you know, to the fact that they can consume more. So that makes perfect sense. And I'm looking for the yuan to actually go even higher. And it's not that the Chinese are trying to displace the dollar because that's an arduous process. It takes a long time. I think it's much more in line with uh, what Gary talks about, is that they want to become a more de domestic based uh, economy, you know, gradually, you know, the, the Chinese don't really move fast at anything. This has been a very, everything has been a gradual process. Um, and it is when you talk about, you know, global deflation, as you bring more of these, uh, you, you, you now introduce uh, that much more uh, of the uh, of the global labor pool, you know. As uh, as I used to laugh with uh, Rick Santelli, I say, you know, every time Bernanke would talk about Nehru, I wondered whether he was talking about the non-accelerated inflation rate of unemployment, or the fact that there were a billion Chinese, I, I'm sorry, a billion Indians coming into the labor force, because that's the Nehru that interests me far more than the. Um, the, the output gap that the uh, Fed had been uh, so fixated on. So I, I think that that is true. It, and, it, and it is. China, China is slowly evolving because they do things, again, very slowly, uh, relative especially to the way the West moves. And they are, they are moving to be a much more consumer-oriented, uh, which I think we're starting to see some change. You know, Richard, I've discussed uh, probably for six months already you know, that the only, you know, and I, with uh, Mark Faber, we've talked about it quite a bit. Yeah, we wanted to be long, uh, high quality uh, mining companies and the uh, large uh, agricultural, uh, like Bungie and uh, ADM. And they've actually been doing very well because ag prices have actually been moving up. But I think that's because the Chinese are just importing everything that they can. Gary, if we look at real estate um, as an area for a discussion, what, what are your thoughts there uh, in terms of the exodus from cities to the countryside and suburbs, larger unit size trends, apartments, condos in cities, um, single family housing, your thoughts? Yeah, well, as a matter of fact, we did uh, cover that extensively last month in our monthly, uh, monthly newsletter, Insight. Uh, and you have a very interesting situation now. Normally, Real estate all moves together. When you have a strong economy, residential housing is strong. People want apartments. They have more jobs, need more office buildings, more shopping, more malls, more people going to, to, to college, need more dormitories, and so on. So they all move together. But now it's a it's it's really a zero sum game because what's happened is with the virus, people want to get out of cities. They want to get out of expensive small apartments. They want to get to the suburbs or even to rural areas where there's more space, where they can have a home office, where their kids who are home have more room to, to study and play computer games if they're not, if they're not doing their homework. Uh, and and they, 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 so it's a, it, you've seen a huge zeal for single family housing, uh, particularly in uh, suburbs and, and, and rural areas. And at the same time, uh, apartments are, are in trouble uh, and, and, uh, and malls, uh, office buildings and so on. 
And of course, one of the things that we're going to see push comes to shove on this very quickly at the beginning of next year is foreclosures. They have been held off by moratoria at the local, state, and federal level, but they expire about the end of this year. So we're going to see uh, we're going to see some interesting uh, financial problems for 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 uh, uh, people with heavy mortgages who don't have the income to support them. But it is a very very different kind of real estate market in the past. And you just you just sort of you, you look at the single family, that's where it is. And of course you get you get the Amazon effect from that, which is already strong. People ordering from home as opposed to going to uh, bricks and mortar stores. It's it's been greatly enhanced by the by the virus. Uh, you just look at what people are doing and it's changed. Now is this gonna is this gonna persist? That's the real question. It's here, it's it's obvious. You can't miss it now. Will it last? Uh, probably to a degree, probably to a degree. Now, there's no question you're getting huge mortgage financing, refinancing, low interest rates are a big factor there as well. And it's no doubt being overdone. But I rather suspect that you are, we will see some permanent changes. More people, maybe not working full time from home, but at least part time, they want, they want home offices. Uh, uh, people will want to uh, spend more time away from the office, commuting. A lot of people understand that you know commuting isn't much fun, and I got to tell you that uh, I moved our shop from from uh, downtown Manhattan to suburban New Jersey in 1990, and I shortened my commute from about an hour and a half each way a day to well five minutes if I miss the light, about three minutes uh, three minutes if I don't. Uh, I'm 1.4 miles away from our office, wow. so it, it 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 you know it really it really makes makes a huge difference, and I think we're going to see these these effects linger linger, and that is going to that is changing the configuration of real estate. You know, real estate in, intrinsically is worth nothing. The only value of real estate is what somebody can put on there that will generate income, and they hope it will generate appreciation. Uh, but land per se, you know, what good does it do you? It's, it's only what you can put on it. And I think that's one of the things that people are beginning to realize is that the idea that somehow this real estate is valuable and will never go down. Uh, that's just not reality. And we're seeing that now. And you mentioned on the malls, shopping malls, the, what types of repurposing business models could you see for malls? Well, that, that of course, that's been going on for some time. The, the, uh, the class... Class uh, B and Class C malls, you know, the, the lesser grade malls have been under pressure for 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 some time, uh, at, particularly with Amazon coming in and the online shopping. But it's even more so now. So what they're trying to re, they're re, they're really trying to repurpose them. What are they doing? They're well. What's one of the most ironic moves now is that Amazon is putting distribution centers. In other words, they're taking they're taking uh, uh, store space in malls. And turning it into uh, distributions, warehouses, in effect. Well, you know that may use the space, but the rents on that tend to be much, much lower than they are for for uh, thriving department stores back in their heydays. So, uh, a lot of these malls are, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, they are going bankrupt. There are many more of them will. Uh, they're not going to disappear entirely, but the the heyday of the mall is over and. And it's really the online shopping uh, plus the virus, which has enhanced that, which has has wiped it out. And okay, you can put gyms in, you can put Amazon distribution centers, you can you can put in uh, restaurants and so on. But it's it's uh, it, it they they just don't have the the traffic, they don't have the sales per square foot, they don't have the revenue generating capability of up, up, upscale retail stores. Interesting. And your thoughts, Ira, for real estate? Yeah. And I think that's right. And one of the things that got me a while ago to be long bonds before COVID was, of course, what happened with WeWork. And WeWork was an enormous amount of overhang into the real estate market that the real estate market could not absorb whatsoever. And that was going to keep uh, downward pressure, especially on uh, office and even some residential so, uh, and we haven't, nobody's even discussed that since the advent of COVID. Uh, I, I, do, I do think that that's right. There's a lot of pressure. But then I look to say, well, what can they do? So 
with the Fed being as active as they have, you know, and I and I watched it as it played out with the drama of uh, the fiscal stimulus, uh, the second one that they couldn't come to terms with, and I, and I know or, uh, or I'm pretty sure that a lot of it was that Pelosi absolutely needed a major. Um, injection of liquidity into the state state municipal governments. And uh, of course, uh, McConnell did not want to give that. So, I mean, that's the drama that played out. But, you know, I wonder why doesn't, you know, would the Fed, I know 13-3, and we're, but they've, they've walked around 13-3 in so many ways, even the, uh, the great Paul Volcker, and I mean that in all sincerity, warned with AIG back in 2008, 2009, that they were on, getting on thin ice with 13.3. But it, can they go into the secondary market uh, and buy up a lot of uh, mortgage-backed securities, uh, all kinds of types of real estate debt, as well as municipal debt, not, pri not in the primary market, but in the secondary market, and then just warehouse it and uh, declare a moratorium on interest rate payments in order to keep uh, uh, the the uh, the pipes open, so to speak. And that's you know I I don't know I, that's why I can't get into the the deflationary uh, I can't get deeper in it because to me the Fed has signed on as I like to say they're now a social sir they're they're now the Ministry of Social Justice because you know uh, Powell had can't say it enough that these people lost jobs, the businesses are closing through no fault of their own. And once you go down that road, okay, I'm not a, I'm not a spender, but I'm a lender. And how creative can I get my lending? And then how does that free up the uh, flow of credit in the system? I, 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 I've got a lot of things that I'm waiting to see here. Let, let, let me add one thing about malls. You know, and I, I live in Short Hills, New Jersey, which is an upscale uh, New York suburb, and and uh, there's a uh, most people who are not in the immediate area. If they've ever heard of Short Hills, New Jersey, it's because of the mall. It's it's a Class A mall and uh, highly successful. But there's a lot of housing in the area which probably never would have been built except for that mall. People want to be close to to shopping. Well, when you see malls in trouble and this is a class A mall. I don't think they're they're going down the tubes. But you want to see a lot of the lesser quality malls uh, that are going out of business. What happens to the housing in the area? What happens to all the all the activity that was really centered around those malls in terms of residential living and so on and so forth? Uh, in other words, I I don't think you simply stop and say it stops at the uh, edge of the parking lot. It 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 uh, it has much broader implications. Gary, uh, last question on uh, very fascinating background you have as a professional beekeeper, apiarist. Uh, just wondering how you got into this and what are your thoughts in general on agriculture and food investments? Well, we've got a, a, a bunch of dwarf fruit trees around our premises and I never thought they were getting pollinated properly. So um, I wanted to put in some beehives. I knew nothing about it, it was just a romantic idea. And my wife kept saying, come on, this is this is no farm, this is suburbia. But then our, senior, our third son was doing his senior college thesis on bees, and that's all it took to push me over the edge. So one afternoon when my wife was out, uh, we smuggled in a couple of hives. Now, she says she knew what was going on. But anyway, uh, he was living at, at home, out of college, working in New York. But then he took off a, um, he, he took off for a job on the Chicago Merck, uh, as a uh, as a, uh, a, a trader, a euro bond trade, uh, euro dollar trader, and I was instantly promoted to head beekeeper. Well, you know, it's one of these things that just grows. I think by the time he left, we maybe had 20 hives, and it just grows and grows. And I've got about 100 hives, and it's a very very time consuming hobby. I've got two of my staff who who work with me on that now, and and we give away all the honey. Uh, we give away about three or four thousand one pound jars of honey to our clients and friends. If I ever 
if I ever uh, uh, sold any, I'd have to start keeping the books on it. And I don't want to make myself cry because my time would end up being worth a dollar an hour with a minus sign in front of it. <laughs> it's very uh, labor intensive, but it's, it's, uh, you know, we, we, we always like to have labels on it that it make it a distinctive grift. And, and, you know, this, this, this year, I think our, our label is uh, regardless of the, of the, of the, uh, election outcome our honey is a sweet success uh, we always have something uh, have something uh, something topical uh, but it's uh, it's uh, you know honey is a, is a is a very niche kind of uh, area it's a small area one interesting point though we were delayed in bottling it this year because of the lack of availability of of bottles plastic bottles now this is globalization because these these jars are made in china but all the production was being uh, diverted to make jars for hand sanitizers with the virus. So it's only now, uh, next week, that we're going to be able to start bottling the, the honey to send out uh, for Christmas. Now, as far as a broader question about agriculture, and they say this is a very, very uh, small niche niche area. Uh, but in terms of, of agriculture uh, production, you know, I, I, the one thing you, you see in agriculture and commodities in general is that uh, shortages never last. And yes, there are disruptions in supply chains. And you, you, do, you have to worry a, a great deal about what's happening in China. China now is buying more U.S. Uh, grain, soybeans uh, in particular. They're buying pork. They had a, a problem with a, the with a, a swine flu disease. And they like pork, uh, so so you know you see these things on a on a short term basis, but but basically um, agriculture is 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 pretty much confined by uh, by demand, and it and uh, it's it's a type of thing where now to be successful in agriculture you need scale. The idea of the family farm, you know, that's a myth that was probably uh, won out uh, in re economic reality 100, 100 years ago. It's really large commercial farms. And when you look at a country like China, you know, there are people that are still cultivating maybe one acre and they call that a farm. Well, when they get there, when they get that rationalized and, and, and apply the kind of production techniques and technology that they've applied to manufacturing, boy, there's going to be more than enough food in the world. So. This is not a, a, a long-term problem. Yes, the distribution is, is always a problem, getting food to people who don't have the income to pay for it. But in terms of the basic supply, uh, I don't see that as an issue. And your thoughts, Ira, on agriculture? Well, I, you know, I, it's, as, as uh, Gary says, you know, the cure, you learn in agriculture, the cure to high prices is high prices, which is true of any real commodity because uh, as long as you have more land and, and farmers can enhance their technology, but there are periods of time when there are shortages in some places. And I, you know, there's one thing in the world I think that truly holds is that the Chinese, in the way that they've grown and their diets have changed, they really have shifted. And this is an overused phrase, but they have shifted that demand curve because you can go back and the last time we've seen four or five dollar beans which, you know, when crops were really good, you would see it. And now you, the United States isn't even the biggest producer anymore. It's the Brazilians who have really filled the void. But here's the, you know, the Brazilians, the Brazil, Brazilians have actually been importing U.S. beans because those bins are empty. You know, with the real, when the real ran up to 5.8 last year and beans were at nine and a half, ten dollars U.S. terms, uh, nine dollars, uh, still Brazilian farmers were getting record high prices in terms of real. So they were selling everything. And um, right now people are a little bit nervous, you know, because people, people are, farmers are always nervous. People in that industry are always nervous because, you know, you are subject to a lot of uh, forces beyond your control. And it's been a little dry in uh, South America at the moment, but I still, I still think that as the world the world ramps up and becomes more middle class, food changes dramatically. And I think we're in the throes of that. Uh, and, and the world will adjust. You know, one of the bad things about the tariffs, and I, uh, when I as I blogged in March of 2018, it was a terrible decision because 
the Trump administration laid on those tariffs right when this when the Brazilian uh, harvest was taking place. So the Chinese had an immediate alternative and they destroyed a lot of goodwill that American farmers had spent 40 years building up to uh, to sell to the Chinese. It was terribly timed. It's like uh, you know, when the air traffic controllers back in, uh, when was it, 82, eight, yeah, 82, when they called a, uh, a strike in, in August. Well, you have a lot of alternatives uh, to travel. I never understood that. Anybody who's ever done any labor organizing, you look for the most vulnerable time, not the easiest time for those who you're trying to affect. Uh, so, but, but I think agriculture is a good sector and it's been an underinvested, meaning uh, it's been shunned by a lot of investors. That's why I liked uh, the, the companies that I did because I like high quality companies that pay a decent dividend and when they're shunned because, you know, they're just not, there's not enough activity in them to uh, elicit the you know, movement from, from the algorithms and everything else. So, uh, you know, I like that play. But I was going to, I would ask <laughs> Gary if uh, I thought he was into the bees because of Bernard Mandeville, uh, the fable of the bees, that uh, was a good, it was a good lesson. But I, I admire that because I'm allergic to bees. So I always have to carry an EpiPen when I play golf or do things outside. So uh, I actually had a bunch of bees down here in Scottsdale at my home. And we had a, a guy who comes out and he's called the bee man. And, he, and he, he vacuums up all the bees and he takes them back to his, his um, beehives. But he can't sell the honey because he says it, he gives it away like Gary does. He gives it to charity because if he were to sell it, then he has to meet all the government regular regs and he just does not want to go through it. But he produces massive amounts of honey that he gives away to the poor. Well, it's been great insight, gentlemen. Uh, uh, Gary, how can our listeners learn more about the monthly in-flight newsletters? The toll-free number 1-888-346-7444, the best way? That's correct. They, they, they can do that or they can go to our website, www.agaryshilling.com. That's A-G-A-R-Y-S-H-I-L-L-I-N-G. There's no C in shilling, it's S-H. And uh, if anyone's interested, we'd be delighted to send you a complimentary copy. You can, you can see what, we're, uh, what, we, what we write about uh, in, in this, this month's issue. We talk about the, the global situation. We talk about what's going on in, in real estate. Uh, we talk about, the, uh, about, about commodities. Uh, Obviously, trying to figure out ahead of time a little bit about the election, but we'll know a lot more later when they finally get it settled. Um, but we and and we uh, we also uh, have our investment strategies, and and we we manage money. We are registered investment advisors, so what we recommend in the newsletter are things that we are investing in for uh, the accounts that we manage. Great, and Ira, about your work. Uh, you know, if I am going to get back to full-time blogging, uh, I've been on hiatus uh, for a while, just tired, and it's the same discussions over and over again. So, I, But I really enjoy doing these podcasts, and this is another one I really enjoy. But uh, back to uh, Notes from Underground, and uh, I think the world is going to get very interesting. The elections, uh, I think, are almost over. Uh, we'll see the way they really settle out. But then the world, the rest of the world become, will become far more interesting. And I'm, I'm looking for lots of volatility in all kinds of arenas going forward. But I will be back to blogging and hopefully still being invited to do these podcasts and a few others. So thank you. And I want to say, Dr. Shelley, this was really, uh, this was really very, very special for me. Um, I, know, I have a friend, um, and I know you know him, uh, Mr. Malamed, who's a big fan of yours and has been a big fan of yours for 40 years, I think, 35 years. So uh, it, this is a true honor. Great. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Gary and Ira, thank you. You're most welcome. Glad to be of service. <laughs> The FRA Roundtable Insight Show is for informational and educational purposes only. 
and should not be considered as a solicitation or offer to purchase or sell any securities. The investments, investment strategies, and investment philosophies discussed or presented on the show each involve their own unique risk factors which are not discussed on the show. Any discussions among the panel participants or responses to listener inquiries are based on the personal opinions of the panel participants and do not take into consideration the listener's suitability, objectives, or risk tolerance. Please be advised that you invest or speculate at your own risk. 